just ridiculous to sit in your home and, and tell yourself that you're not worthy of something, especially as a woman. No, 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 no. <laughs> I guess we just have to create our own content and, you know, <laughs> Definitely. our own companies and do it ourselves. You know, it's these weird fear barriers. And once you hop over those, this incredible and massive beauty just lays out before you. Welcome to the Theatre Art Life podcast and hello. We're putting the spotlight on those who create live entertainment around the globe, the culture creators and the backstage masters. My name is Anna Rod. And my name is Anna Aguilera. On this episode, we will be talking to Julianne Buescher about all things acting and then some more. Julianne Buescher is a whimsically versatile, classically trained actor with a BFA in acting, able to perform comedy and drama and improv with equal ease. Julianne's experience includes television, films, theatre, musicals, commercials, sketch and improv comedy, with a wide range of series regular co- and guest star lead and supporting roles. Julianne is also a seasoned voiceover artist for video games, animation, commercials, narration and hosting, promos and looping, and most fun, a freakish ability to voice match most celebrities and singers. Oh, we're going to have to ask you to do that. And Julianne is also a Muppet performer, voicing and puppeteering countless Muppet and Jim Henson characters. Julianne has travelled the globe performing fan faves such as Yolanda the Rat, Denise, Kermit's new girlfriend on the ABC series, May and Grandma on Sid the Science Kid, Sherry Netherland on Sesame Street, and now some very surprising new characters are arriving on Disney. Thank you for joining us on Theatre Art Life, Julianne, and welcome. Thank you. Hello. What an incredible <laughs> resume you have. It's amazing. Aside from, um, you know, what we just read about you, how did you get into working in this industry and, and particularly working with, with, with the Muppets? Uh, well, I've always been um, performing in some way or another. My whole family had always been doing that um, for generations. Uh, I guess uh, there was a, an opera singer in our history also in Europe. But I think I was first on the stage when I was three years old. My aunt was in a production of Cheaper by the Dozen, and I was the youngest little girl. And I did something. Climbing up the stairs, I fell off the stairwell on the stage, and everyone went, oh! but apparently I just brushed my little dress off and got right back on and kept going. <laughs> <laughs> and that was the start. Yeah. I didn't uh, begin Muppets, and I didn't think about puppeteering as part of the, the acting circle until I moved out to Los Angeles. Um, I saw a bunch of people sitting at a table, and they had Kermit jackets on. That was the big thing in the 90s. Whatever production you were on, you wore a big woolly jacket that had your production on the back of it. And um, just went up and thanked them for being wonderful. You know, love you, love the Muppets. Love you guys. Thank you so much. And one of the guys at the table said, well, you know, Jim's a really nice guy. You want to come and meet him? <laughs> I went, what? what do you... Yeah, come and meet Jim Henson. But I, uh, I was too nervous and very young. And um, for three weeks, I thought, I'm going to pick up the phone. And no, I'm not going to. I'm not, I'm not worthy. I'm not worthy. And he passed away in those three weeks. Oh, my goodness. In 1990. So I said, I will never say no to anything. I'm just going to dive in and see what happens. And then his son, a few months later, was trying to get a crew of improv performers together to train us puppeteers on his first show, Dinosaurs. So I went in and I auditioned. I didn't say no. And, and then I was hired. Amazing. That's, uh, that's such a special story, given the fact that uh, you were so close yet so far to, to meeting him. <laughs> and what a, what a lesson of life, you know. It's ridiculous to sit in your home and, and tell yourself that you're not worthy of something, especially as a woman. No, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> so you've done everything when it comes to acting. Do you have a favourite genre? Is, is puppeteering one of your favourites or is it just sort of the one that you've been most successful in? It's definitely the most fun and it's just the, the loveliest group of people. If you're going to be in entertainment, which is a bit of a rough, rough industry especially out here in los angeles being with particularly with the muppet family is um 
the most joyous and safest and kindest uh, family bubble to be in in entertainment. But my favorite genre is actually um, improvisation, like unscripted series or improv on stage is absolutely my favorite. Is there anything on the acting realm that you haven't done? I don't think so. Um, I'm one of those that I can also sing. I can also dance. So there were, there was never any little um, branch that that wasn't open to me. So I, I kind of tried it all. I, I I love the the art of it. So whatever form it takes, I'm I'm willing to jump in and, and try whatever form it takes. I've done motion capture. I've done all of it. Yeah. <laughs> Are there many uh, improv sort of bars or groups in, in L.A. that you can go and hang out in in your spare time? Yeah, well, not right now. Yeah, there are quite a few. Um, I started at Second City, which is my favorite. They, they all have a very specific style to them. Uh, and Second City, I'm from the Midwest, so it, it had a very familiar feel for me. Some of the other groups in Los Angeles are a little... Uh, they tend to be, there's a little bit of a cruelty factor and that's not my style. I don't enjoy that very much. Um, I like the lighter, more intelligent, more family centered form. So when, when you're creating on or working on a character or on your, even when you're doing improv, how's your process? It depends on the, on the genre like if it were a, a series or a film, I, I like to get a hold of the script and read it and see what the other characters are saying about the character that I'm going to play. I think that's really informative. And then kind of, it's very instinctual. If, if something pops up, I'll get images like what, sh what would she wear? How would she move? And I'm very interested in psychology. So kind of mapping out, you know, what, what, where is she? Is she on the spectrum? Is she, you know... And then fill the character out that way. When you come to the Muppets, you're obviously given a, pu a, a puppet to work with. So how do how do you approach that when you when you see the puppet? Is it are you inspired by its visual, or do you bring other elements into it? Very much inspired by the visual. Um, sometimes a voice will pop up right away. Also, depending on how it's built, will inform how it moves, and then that informs the voice as well. Like uh, Beverly Plume, the turkey, who is on Muppets now, right now, you know, with that, she's got a very loose neck. She's surprisingly small and really easy to, to manipulate. So uh, she, it was, she was able to have a very fluid, odd little voice. In terms of doing voices for, like the voice matching that I do when I voice match celebrities, it's also about the movement of the body. I, I like to watch the actor that I am going to match and watch how they do they you know hold their jaw really tight what do they do with their neck do they hold their lips like over their teeth that totally informs where their voice is coming from and how wow did you did you work when you did you sort of do any study in terms of voice work like that or is that developed over your own experience um throughout your career that kind of was also inherent kind of naturally there um also, you know, my family was always doing things like that. Like my little cousins would um, call my mom and she would answer the phone as Cookie Monster. <laughs> so we were always doing weird stuff like that. <laughs> yeah, totally, totally natural. That's amazing. And when it comes to different accents and dialects, where does your research start? It comes really easy for me. It's something about the ear. It's, it's musical. I, different accents. It's listening to the music and the lilt first, and then again, looking at the musculature of, of that particular region, like what's going on. Is there a, where's the tongue placed? You know, is there something specific they're doing with their lips? It's, it's this pretty much the same thing, muscular and, and music together. Yeah, we were speaking to Isaac Robinson, who's a voiceover artist uh, recently, and he said exactly the same. It's very musical for him to uh, listen and look to other people and then, and then try to repeat that musicality within the voice. So it's interesting that you also say the same. 
Oh, really? Did he say that? It's, I mean, it is a skill and people are attuned to it. I mean, definitely it's not my skill set. I'm not going to be able to do very good accents. <laughs> What's your favourite character um, in terms of the, the, the Muppets? And, and can you give us a, a little bit of an example of their voice? Well, Yolanda was always my favourite. Yolanda the Rat, she was, you know, always my favourite. But she was, a sta- you know, I had to imitate what was established before because somebody performed her as a New York rat. So now my favorite has become Beverly Plume the turkey because, well, she just, I'm the first to perform her, so I can do whatever I like. <laughs> That's amazing. And you've also done stuff for video games. How did, uh, how did you get into that? I guess, you know, I think LA is the place where they make a lot of that work as well. So you're in the right location. Oh, I love games. I'm also a gamer. So how weird is it to very weird to play my favorite game? And like, all of a sudden I'll hear myself talking. <laughs> I, did, I, also, I also didn't realize voiceover was a thing. And uh, about, I think in 1996, I had cancer and was totally bald and recovering from pretty harsh chemo. And um, I was like, oh, what do I do now? I can't puppeteer right now. I can't go on camera. Um, so I started voiceover. And I'm also one of the few women that really enjoys doing creatures like orcs and fairies and weird aliens. So um, I get to do a lot of that in the games. What is the what is one of the games that we would know that you're that you're in? Starcraft Two, Elder Scrolls, Oblivion. Oh my God, there's so many. Minecraft. Is that a big network or a big industry? Uh, female voices in video games. Yeah, it's it's pretty even for for women in in video games kind of it's still that thing of you know no matter what genre it is it's it's mm, we're still trying to break that thing of you're the girlfriend or the wife or the mother and that's it some kind of sexual you know attachment but trying to trying to break it on on the periphery of the main characters yeah yeah it's only really recently that Ray and Star Wars, you know, I mean, it's, a, it's a pretty recent phenomenon. Mm. Then when it comes to puppeteering, for example, it's a very male-dominated part of the industry, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> yeah, it, it's been frustrating. I've been um, performing with the Muppets for 30 years, and right now I'm the only female performing with them. But still, after 30 years, I'm still not invited to be one of the core performers, even though I have my own characters. Uh, It's very confusing. I'm very sad. And also frustrating because I know if I am so grateful to be a part of, I, I, I love, you know, my Muppet family. But I know that if I say too much or bring it up, there is an, a female puppeteer behind me who will say, I will take it. I will, I will be, you know, you can even pay me less. You can pay me below union scale and I'll do it. So we can, you know, as women, we can fight all we want for our rights, but if there are other women behind us that are going to undermine it, it's going to set us back 40 years again. So that's, that's the real problem. It's not so much what's, you know, (laughs) what the guys are doing. It's what the women behind us are doing. Well, that's an interesting take, but I, I totally understand it, right? Because you just have to be a collective to really shift shift the perception and that, and come in as a team to to overcome the 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 domination of males in in a particular skill set or genre, right? Yeah, yeah. And because there are so few roles open for women, you know that the whole sharing thing is is more difficult as well. You know, you can't say, "Well, come on in, and we'll have two women." Which is funny because you said, you know, in the video game world, it's fairly even, right? So you've, it, there's, it, there's, it's like the, the Muppet world or the puppet world is, is, is quite far behind in terms of uh, its, its progressiveness. Yeah, the, well, the frustration is that that culture, you know, that they, they want to call it a culture. Our Muppet culture was created, you know, back in the 50s, 70s, and we don't, we don't know if we want to change that. You know, that's, it's this precious thing. But is it really working now? Because Miss Piggy, that's a, is that a male voice or a female voice historically? That's a male, uh, male performer. 
Janice is performed by uh, a man. That's another problem is when you've got the, the male core performers. They're the ones that get into the, the meetings with the writers and they're like, let's do my character doing this. Let's do my character doing this. And there's no discussion of, hey, what about that female character? Because since I'm not invited to be a core member, I'm not in on the meetings to say, hey, how about if my character does this? So it's that kind of catch-22 loop, you know? So in the, in the, generally in the acting world, is it in outside the, that, that realm, how do you foresee the gender gap issue being addressed? I'm just watching a lot of great women speak up and then, then you know, unfortunately getting blacklisted for it. So kind of in that place right now. And then also, you know, when they speak up, even though they're stars, they'll speak up, they'll get blacklisted. And again, it's that the girl behind will come in and, and be like, I'll do it topless for no money. You know, that thing. I don't know. I don't know how we're going to get over that hurdle. Change is slow, I think, in that in that world. Cult, the culture shifts very slowly and uh, unfortunately not fast enough for us who are in the midst of it, I think. Yeah, yeah. I guess we just have to create our own content and, you know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Definitely. Our own companies and do it ourselves. Yeah, why not? So would you think that everyone in the world should do some kind of improv at some point in their lives? I really do. I really think it's it's incredibly freeing. Um, it's great for writers. It's great for artists. It's great for people who have fear of public speaking. It's I, in general. I think everybody should try it. It knocks a fear out of you that somebody else put there long ago that doesn't belong. I, I mean, to to be so free and open and to trust your instincts and to trust the other person there the words come it's really weird the stories just start pouring out and yeah it it, it works it's amazing highly recommend it for everybody and i think the ability to think on your feet right because you're always so put on the spot on improv and you've got to uh, you know it's a kind of a mind training wouldn't you think just to be able to be receiving information and then act on it very quickly in front of a, an audience so i i can imagine that doing that regularly would make you very confident on stage yeah, on stage and in, I mean, I would, I would put like emergency um, responders in there, you know, to like take that, that weird glazed fear portion, like out of your being. Yeah. So that you can like do, you know, you're ready to improvise emergency help. You're ready to improvise. That'd be interesting to have like EMTs and doctors and yeah, completely people that are not in the arts industry at all will get up there and do that. That would be fun to watch. Yeah. It's just a weird plug that's in everybody's brain that just needs to be popped. Yeah. Is this why you like it so much? I love it. Love it. That that It's such a, an amazing abandon to be. It's like this weird chant. You're like become a conduit to some kind of muse. Literally, things pop out of your mouth that, you know, you you can't plan it anymore. It's that letting go of the planning and being in this immediacy. It's incredible. It's an incredible feeling. Sounds very psychoanalytical. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You have to let go of yeah, control and, yeah, it's amazing. Amazing. Um, you've got some other interesting skills in your career, including underground comic writer and illustrator, anatomical dissection of fascia studies, and lock picking. What? <laughs> tell, tell us about these things. What is happening? Well, I love the graphic novel things. I, I can also draw and, and write. And like of all the, the arts, to do a graphic novel, you're you're the director, you're all the actors, you're the lighting designer, you're the set designer. So that's that's why I love that so much. The anatomical dissection and the fascial studies are based on this. Uh, every single, almost every single one of the puppeteers I know are having hip replacements and shoulder replacements, and because of the, it's incredibly hard work. It's a it's a sport, and I'm trying to study what we're doing wrong, the way we're holding ourselves and operating our bodies. Um, so I'm studying this tensegrity of the fascia and I go to anatomical dissection 
to study that on untreated um, cadavers. It's incredible. I, w- I would recommend that too to anybody. I don't think everyone <laughs> can take it. Though. <laughs> <laughs> That's the thing. That's another one of those quirks in the brain to to, to overcome. Yeah, <laughs> because it, it stops. You know, it's these weird fear barriers. And once you hop over those, this incredible and massive beauty just lays out before you. And, you know, in the, in the formation of the brain, you can see the formation of the sands in a delta, um, all the veins, you know, taking back the skin. You can see how they match all the veins and leaves. It's stunning. It's beautiful. You see our interconnectedness with the rest of the earth, really, I think, when you start to look at it that way, right? Yeah. And stop having this phobia of, of death, you know, because Western culture is really cut off from. I think from our natural, you know, growing old and dying. And that's another thing about Hollywood is aging. Like this lack of acceptance for aging is insane. Yeah. That's, it's something to, you know, working outside of that realm and then looking into it, it does, it does, you see it as a, as a package. Do you know, does that make any sense? And you like, you've got all of the people with their, their Botox and their fillers and their work. And it's like, I'm just, I'd be too, I'm too lazy for that. <laughs> oh my God. And I, I just, speaking of the whole anatomical thing, um, I just did a, I just read a study of um, these women who have Botox and then have these babies. The babies are, cannot learn emotion from the faces because they're, they're, the women's faces don't move. Oh my goodness. I never so thought about that. So the babies can't learn emotional <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness oh see like that studying that kind of like psychological thing would be very fun and fascinating for me when you think about that the the, the ramifications of of doing that is huge yeah. Could be huge. <laughs> so wow, I never thought about that <laughs> but, but going back to the 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 fascia studies and things so that I guess when you said being a puppeteer is is a sport you're also like I guess you're probably very awkward positions many times right when you're when you're doing like do, do they make the conditions easier for you when you're when you're doing your work like creating a platform you can roll around on or what's the what's the logistics behind the puppet yeah we do have um specific chairs and rollies we call them um depending on where we're stuck if we're under a cabinet if we have to move a great distance um like when we did the the shows on stage recently the live shows when we were in london and at the Hollywood Bowl, um, you know, we had little special chairs and rolling back and forth. But, well, one of the hardest things is when we were doing the live shows, we also did um, Outside Lands where we did a rock concert. And for the guys to hold their arms in the air like that, we had to build these rigs where they could actually, it was like a strap around their body and so a big pole up their arms so they could have a little rest. But yeah, the arm is always up in the air. The other arm is holding the rods. Your hip is like tweaked out because that one arm is up in the air like that. Your neck is twisted and looking down. A lot of neck problems. It's really interesting. It's like a violin players always get that weird neck thing and shoulder problems, you know? Yeah. And it's not like you can just like swap the puppet onto the other other hand for a break, right? <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Give my right arm a break. Let's put him in the left. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still stuck. With the idea of watching other people going to see bodies, dead bodies. In one of my previous lives, <laughs> so no, when I was younger, I I ended up going to this um, an autopsy, and it was a group of people. And at the end of it, it was for me. It was actually really funny and very interesting. And like actually being with the corpse and being in contact with the body, as you were describing it, was fascinating was super super interesting one of the best experiences in my life but then also it was really funny to see how especially the guys started fainting and puking and just leaving the room one by one and at the end it was only another girl and me left in the room until we finished the autopsy of this person and finished the paperwork and then but I didn't I, at some point, like I remember the first people leaving, 
And then I remember just being the two of us at the end. I don't know what happened in between. I was probably just too concentrated on what we were doing. But yeah, everyone else left. So I would pay to see all these reactions that I didn't get to see that time. Oh, that's awesome that you did that. So cool. Yeah. I oh, know that's that's so, so fascinating that people end up doing those things. I, I have never been anywhere in contact like that to see an autopsy or, or that. And that where is that? Where do you where do you study that, Julianne, in LA? There are a couple of places. Um, I just moved, they just moved to Colorado. There are a couple of places that specifically um let in yoga teachers and artists to do this um five day dissection. And it's only five days because the body, like I was saying, is untreated so that you can actually see the fascia. If it's if it's a treated body, um, you know, with formaldehyde and things like that, then the fascia kind of disappears and you don't get to to work with it. What would you say is the most thing that you like most about your job? I just uh, adore um, putting on other characters, um, learning about what a character would do. Um, and that means, you know, a lot of um, psychological study and just just the, the beauty of telling stories of of people, people's secrets. I, lo- I love the idea of the secrets. Having a character of depth, I think behind the eyes, I think the best actors always have this. They always pick something that they're not going to tell, but they, they keep it right there behind the eyes. And how that interacts with whoever you're you're acting with. That other person has got their secret over there. I think it's just really lovely. It's a lovely dance. I really enjoy it. We might have gone over this a little bit, but if you could change something from your job or the industry, what would it be? I think I would change the the idea of age being something negative. I mean, it's it's just, you know, I, I turned 55 and have just noticed that. When you're in classes, I, you know, I still take classes and do things like that. And, and there's always somebody that says, oh, well, you know, people over 55, women over 55, that's the end of your career. You're just not going to work anymore. And they just say it. I don't know if they, they realize what they're saying or they're just repeating. They're just, it's like a parrot. And they're just saying this because other people have said this. I think that's, that needs to change. <laughs> there's no reverence for the experience of a, a 30 or 40 year long career, you know, even a, as a teacher, there's no, I, I, I don't, I think that's a Western culture thing as well. Just in general, there's no reverence for anybody that's been at a, at a company for 40 or 50 years, the experience that they've gained, the, the knowledge they could pass on. There's no kind of elder role available in Western culture. You just kind of like, do you have long-term care and you're going to retire now? Okay. Bye. Take your desk. Thank you very much. You know, it's really sad. Yeah, and it's very different. I live in a culture that's very particularly different and has much respect for parents and uh, for elderly in the fact that it's kind of um, Asian's culture to take care. When the parents have finished taking care of them, then the son or the daughter then starts to take care of the adult into their ageing years, you know, their parent into ageing years. So it's interesting to see that juxtaposition between cultures of 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 that and it's it's sad for me as a woman growing older too because for me I'm a little bit like you I mean I'm going to do this for as long as I I can and I I love what I do and and a life in art is also like you said that accumulation of your experience from voiceover to acting to improv to things like you just bring a whole library of of stuff to the table um and could be continually and should be continually um, participating in in projects for as for as long as you want to. So, I hope that that we can start to champion the change on that because uh, so that the all of us can go for you know. What I once met somebody that like, oh, when do you want, when do you think you'd retire? And I'm like, I don't even have that idea of retiring. Like, I love what I do, so it's not like. Um, it's not like I'm going to, okay, now I've finished 50 years in banking. I'm going to go retire on my yacht. That's not like, that's not what, that's not our lives. Right. So, uh, yeah, it's interesting. And I think, I, well, I guess particularly where you are is, is one of the, the centers of that as well. Don't you think? Oh yeah. 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 It's hard to watch. It's hard to, 
it's just hard to watch it happen because all of all of my friends that are just so talented and and there's just nothing for them to do now do you think that'll shift not to get political but now that there's a woman vice president and she's also i'm sure she's in her early 50s right so do you think that's going to shift the perception when you can see people in leadership at that age i think so i really do um i think that it's going to be rough because there's a lot of middle american uh resistance to it so but again it's just old old tapes these old things that people are repeating and you know like like parrots like i like i was saying before i think that might be one of the good things about the quarantine is maybe people are at home kind of investigating you know what what they've been thinking or what's really necessary what's what's the change really going to have to be you know i'm hoping that'll be part of it Yes, we can come out the other side more progressive and more, more, you know, and it does, sometimes it does take a, t- a time to stop being so busy to, to really think about, take a look around at your surroundings and go, okay, let's reevaluate our lives and let's reevaluate what we're doing here and uh, where do our values sit, you know? Yeah, yeah. And maybe the fact that most of the deaths are our elders, you know, maybe that'll hopefully change something, take more care of them. Yeah. I also hope, as you mentioned earlier, that we can start not depending so much on the people that don't want to work with us and just start our own things and try to do things. Maybe it won't be as easy or won't have as much of a financial support as the others would, but if at least we can start doing the things that we want to do. Exactly, because I think we... I, you know, at being at 55, I know I'm from uh, a culture where women had to kind of wait for permission to do stuff. We kind of felt like, well, if you'll let us, then maybe. But you're right. I mean, there's no more waiting for permission anymore. Just got to go do it. Mm. Yes. <laughs> That's amazing. Permission. And and permission from who? What were we- <laughs> yeah. Like, who who do we need permission from? <laughs> <laughs> that, that was a very 1950s 1960s thing you know yeah but nope not anymore let's do it let's do it let's do our <laughs> own muppets let's do it that's it if you just to start a start a female-led muppet group that would be amazing yes <laughs> uh do you want to share with our audience um your website and your social media accounts so they can follow you and see the awesome things you do oh gosh yeah um it's julianbusher.com and uh, my instagram is julianbusher and it's a little bit of a tough spell so just uh just google and you'll find it <laughs> we'll add it on It'll the take notes a while. <laughs> okay yeah, we'll put it on the notes so you, everybody can find it <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much this is great uh, it's been such a pleasure to talk to you, Julianne. I wish you best with all of your work and your, you know, studies and your improv and your puppeteering. It's um, amazing to hear somebody who is so uh, well-rounded and has such an incredible career in the arts. So thank you. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you so much. This is awesome. Yay! We would love to hear from you, our listeners, on who you would like us to feature on this podcast or what topics fascinate you. There is a link in our podcast description where you can send us your requests and guest nominations. Theater Art Life provides regular monthly webinars and podcast episodes for free. If you have the means, donations can be made via a link in the podcast notes. We would be thankful for any support you can give us. You can learn more about Theatre Art Live, the global media site for entertainment, at www.theatreartlive.com. And you can follow us on all social media platforms. We want to thank David Sire for composing the music for our podcast and Michelle Sharota, who is our sound engineer. We are your hosts, Anna and Anna, and this is the Theatre Art Live podcast.